Hello and welcome to another video. So today I want to talk about the male gaze. You have probably heard this term at one point or another. I like to go fast. It looks like you're uh, you're distributing. And what I want to do today is to thoroughly explain um, what it actually means. This is also part of a series that I'm making about the male gaze and in the next few videos I'll talk more about the feminist art movement of the 70s as well as talking about artworks and films that subvert the male gaze. So if you want to see the other parts of the series make sure that you subscribe. So the term the male gaze was coined back in 1975 by film critic Laura Mulvey in her essay visual pleasure and narrative cinema. So in this video I'm going to go over the entire essay and explain what it actually says. Then in the end I'll be talking about the female gaze, if it exists, and what it would entail if it did. Part 1. Visual pleasure and narrative cinema by Laura Mulvey. So let us get right into it. I want to warn you though that there will be a lot of talk about Freud coming up, so um, get ready to hear about castration. <laughs> so the essay starts with Mulvey talking about psychoanalysis and how she is intending to use their language and their theories as a political weapon to expose how the unconscious of patriarchal society has structured film form. Mulvey uses theories from both Sigmund Freud and Jacques Lacan in the essay, but she starts off by mentioning the castration anxiety created by Freud, which is the fear of being emasculated both literally and metaphorically by damaging or losing your penis. Freud also claimed that this was a universally human experience, meaning that it applied to women as well, which put women in kind of an awkward position because this meant that women were basically the other ones or the ones who lacked something, whereas men was more the default and men were the ones who were the makers of meaning. Jacques Lacan, also a psychoanalyst, claimed that the language we use which is often infused with patriarchal values, creates the unconscious, which is what makes it so hard to challenge the sexism women endure because it's all happening unconsciously. So the issue with mainstream cinema is that films are so much cheaper to make now than it was in the past, so more and more of this unconscious patriarchal language is being projected into the films. Part 2 Pleasure in looking, fascination with the human form. In the second part of her essay, Mulvey talks about scopophilia, which is another idea created by Freud. Scopophilia is the pleasure of looking at other people or being looked at, and Freud claimed that this was an important part of childhood. Children, according to Freud, develop scopophilia as they are curious about other people's bodies and private parts, which leads to a way of looking that turns the other person into an object. Um, I just want to point out how creepy I'm finding that theory, but you know, that's Freud. <laughs> Freud also says that this is one of the component instincts of sexuality. So Mulvey then likens this phenomenon with the act of going to the cinema. Even though movies are made to be watched, they are still filmed to make us feel like we are looking at a private scene. The cinema is also dimly lit, creating the illusion that we are secretly gazing upon a private scene. Mulvey claims that the audience is taking part of scopophilia as they are watching the movie. Although the film is really being shown, is there to be seen, conditions of screening and narrative conventions give the spectator an illusion if looking in on a private world. She then moves on to mention the mirror phase, which was an idea created by Jacques Lacan. 
The mirror phase refers to when a child starts to recognize themselves in the mirror and Lacan says that the child enjoys looking at themselves because they see the person in the mirror as a better version of themselves. The reflection becomes the child's ideal ego. Mulvey writes, This is a moment when an older fascination with looking collides with the initial inklings of self-awareness. Hence, it is the birth of the long love affair, despair, between image and self-image, which has found such intensity of expression in film and such joyous recognition in the cinema audience. She claims that cinema works in a similar way, and the movie screen acts as the mirror for the audience. The male lead is often played by attractive, accomplished actors, and the male viewer is seeing the lead as his ideal ego. Basically, he sees himself as the leading actor. Mulvey ends this part with explaining that although images of women offers men a beautifully complementary fantasy world, basically images of women give men something unrealistic to ogle, <laughs> according to Freud, the image of a woman also represents castration, and therefore the image of a woman will be both pleasurable and threatening to men. Part 3. Woman as image, man as bearer of the look. So in this part of the essay, Mulvey talks about women's role within cinema. In a world ordered by sexual imbalance, pleasure in looking has been split between active male and passive female. The determining male gaze projects its fantasy onto the female figure, which is styled accordingly. She claims that women are not put into films to make the story progress, and by showing the perspective from a woman's point of view, is seen as a detriment to the film's narrative. She also quotes Bud Bodicher, an American film director, who says, What counts is what the heroine provokes, or rather what she represents. She is the one, or rather the love or fear she inspires in the hero, or else the concern he feels for her, who makes him act the way he does. In herself, the woman has not the slightest importance. The woman is also not just sexualized by the audience watching the film, she's also being sexualized by the male leads of the film. This is because men cannot bear to be sexualized, and so has to assume the active role of sexualizing, and women then has to adopt the role of the passive or being sexualized. Mulvey also talks about how films are supposed to reproduce an accurate representation of reality, now that the mainstream style to make films is realism, and this is done by using certain camera angles, how the camera moves, as well as the way the film is being edited. With this she also brought back what she was saying about the mirror face, and how the male spectator is supposed to assume the role of the male lead. So here's a quote from the essay I want to mention, where she explains how the woman is being sexualized and objectified by the main lead in the movies Only Angel Have Wings and To Have and Have Not. She is isolated, glamorous, on display, sexualized. But as the narrative progresses, she falls in love with the main male protagonist and becomes his property, losing her outward glamorous characteristics her generalized sexuality, her showgirl connotations. Her eroticism is sub subjected to the male star alone by means of identification with him through participation in his power, the spectator can indirectly possess her too. She talks a bit more about the relationship between men and women on the screen. And I mentioned earlier that according to this castration anxiety, men find both pleasure and discomfort by looking at women. To deal with this, men then have two options. The first one is to either save or punish the woman in question. 
Monvey mentions film noir as an example where the male lead often unravels the female character's guilt and in the end either has to rescue her or punish her for it. The second one is to fetishize the woman to the extent that she becomes nothing but a sexual object so that the pleasure of looking at her overcomes the discomfort. Mulvey uses two directors as examples to show her point, Alfred Hitchcock and Joseph von Sternberg. She starts off by saying that Sternberg revels in showing off his main female role, dressing her up and making her look perfect to be presented straight to the audience. Mulvey writes in her essay, Sternberg plays down the illusion of screen depth. His screen tends to be one-dimensional as light and shade, lace, steam, foliage, net, streamers, etc. reduce the visual field. There is little or no mediation of the look through the eyes of the male, male protagonist. So what she is saying is that Sternberg is presenting the female character to be looked at and objectified by the audience. He's not using a male character that the audience is supposed to see her through. Hitchcock, on the other hand, has his audience witnessing the scenes through his male lead. The protagonist of the film is usually put in a place of power and then have the opportunity to subject the woman to punishment for her guilt. The way his films are shot and how he places the male lead in his film makes the audience see him as their ego and the woman is seen then through his eyes. Mulvey uses the movie Vertigo as an example of this and explains how the lead, Scotty, is hired to spy on a beautiful woman who he later becomes obsessed with. He confronts her later in the film and it ends with him interrogating her, compels her to change the way she looks and then finally kills her as punishment. Part 4 Summary Mulvey then ends her essay by noting that there are already many aspects in life where Women are just supposed to be looked at, for example, striptease or photography, but cinema is actively deciding the way that women are being looked at and turns the act of looking into a spectacle by itself. She writes, There are three different looks associated with cinema. That of the camera as it records the pro-filmic event, that of the audience as it watches the final product, and that of the characters at each other within the screen illusion. The problem here is that cinema is presented as if it were real life. The audience is forced to either take part in fetishistic scopophilia, which means looking at an over-sexualized version of the woman, or take on the main lead's perspective and objectify her in that way. The last few sentences of her essay tells us that Disrupting the immersion and making the camera known throughout the film is one way to disrupt the male gaze. However, this will greatly reduce the illusion of realism in the film. The last sentence in the essay reads, Women whose image has been continually stolen and used for this end cannot view the decline of the traditional film form with anything much more than sentimental regret. Part 5. The Female Gaze So before I end this video, I do want to talk a little bit about the female gaze. Feminists have started to use this term more and more to kind of see if there's a female version of the male gaze and what this perspective would entail. One thing that is worth noting is that the male gaze is a result from living in a patriarchal society. The films that have been released that are very male gazy are not made on purpose to degrade women, but they are things that society does unconsciously. The male gaze is just a reflection of the values of society. so. In that case, one can even argue if a female gaze can even exist. A study from 2017 shows that only 2% of women are producers, 
11% are women are writers and 11% are directors. Still, if there is a female gaze, how would you define it? The most basic idea is that both the director and main protagonist are women. Jill Soloway, the director of Transparent and I Love Dick, says that the female gaze is all about bringing out the perspective of women, showing the emotions and characters in the film from a female point of view. Paula Marantz Cohen wrote an essay titled What Have Clothes Got to Do With It? Romantic Comedy and the Female Gaze in which she talks about romantic comedies and examples of the female gaze. She mentions how movies made for women have often been seen as lesser than movies made from men, how chick flicks have a negative tone to it. Before chick flicks they had women's film, which were also seen as lesser. Films directed for women tend to leave heavier on spectacle or aesthetic rather than plot, whereas movies for men tend to lean heavier on plot. And this is partially where this whole idea that men's films are better comes from. Romantic comedies often feature fun, bright colors, well-decorated spaces, the female lead is often wearing loud and interesting clothing, and she's wearing it to evoke interest in the female viewer rather than trying to seduce a male viewer. Romantic films targeted to a female audience often feature a well-off female because of this, as this gives her a reason to wear well-styled and interesting outfits. Marantz Cohen also talks about the lack of overt sexiness in the female leads in movies directed under the female gaze, and uses Something's Got to Give as an example. Diane Keaton plays the female lead in this movie and is presented throughout the film mostly wearing turtlenecks and other so-called unsexy clothing items. Still, she ends up romancing the male lead and it's not through her attractiveness that she wins him over. She wins him over by her personality. Um, anyway, that was a little bit of background on the male gaze and what it means. Um, I hope this video has been helpful and if it was, please do give it a like. Um, also do subscribe if you want to see more. I do have two more videos prepared for this series about the male gaze and feminist art and in my next video I'll be talking about the feminist art scene of the 70s and artworks that subverted the male gaze. Um, I hope I'll see you then. Bye!